just a little bit after nine o'clock. So we are going to hand it over to Carrie, but before we hand it over, I just want to thank everybody for joining us this morning for day three of our coolest conservationist here in New Mexico. We're excited to learn about two more careers um, in the world of conservation. And our first uh, speaker this morning is Miss Carrie Romero. And Carrie, while I get your presentation up and running, do you want to give yourself a little introduction to everybody? Sure, sure. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here. My name's Carrie Romero. I'm the executive director for the New Mexico Council of Outfitters and Guides. The council is a nonprofit organization and we advocate the outfitter and guide industry in New Mexico. So basically, we protect um, a person's right to earn a living as an outfitter or a guide. So I'm really glad to be here. Thank you, Sarah, for thinking of us as one of the 10 coolest conservation careers. And um, yeah, let's get started. I want this to be super informal. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to raise your hand throughout the presentation. We'll also do questions afterwards, but feel free to stop me. I have a tendency to ramble on and on if no one puts a stop to it. So feel free to interrupt. So today we're gonna to talk about what it's like to be an outfitter or a guide and how you can become an outfitter or a guide if that is what you would like to do with your career. And um, if you are the type of kid that really likes being outdoors, likes being in nature, loves hunting, loves fishing, then becoming an outfitter or a guide might be the perfect career for you. So um, you can go to the next slide, Sarah. So what exactly is an outfitter or a guide? So uh, the basic concept of an outfitter is someone who takes a, another person who they call clients on a trip. And it works a couple of different ways depending on where you are in the country or where you are in the world. There, are, There's an outfitter and guide industry in basically every state and every country in the world. So sometimes things are called something different, but in New Mexico, the outfitter is essentially the business owner and their business takes clients on hunting or fishing trips or recreational trips, trail rides, and the outfitter owns the business. The guide is their employee. And so the guide is actually the person that is going out into the woods and taking people into the woods and helping them hunt for um, whatever they're hunting for or, or take them on a fishing trip or lead them on a trail ride. That's what the guide does. And sometimes the outfitter is the guide, but essentially that's kind of the hierarchy of, of how the business model works. The outfitter is the business owner, guide is the employee, and then outfitters also hire all types of different positions in their business. They also hire camp cooks to feed their clients. They hire wranglers, which might be somebody who's, you know, grown up around horses and really knows how to um, work with livestock. And so they're really comfortable around those animals and, and they'll pack the clients into the back country, into the wilderness. Then they also will hire packers, which, might just be someone that comes and helps um, when when the game is harvested and when the hunting is done, they help they help the hunter retrieve the meat. So next slide. So there's basically three types of activities within the outfitting industry in New Mexico hunting, fishing, and recreation. And recreation can include basically anything, anything from uh, horseback riding in the summertime, hiking, there's Jeep tours in Southern New Mexico, um, river rafting tours along the Rio Grande near Taos, basically encompasses anything outdoor recreation. 
next slide. So we're gonna we're gonna start with hunting, and um, and then you can move to the next slide, Sarah. And I'm basically going to talk about some of the big game that is huntable in New Mexico. And many people don't know this, but New Mexico has more huntable big game than any other state in the lower 48, which basically means that we have more huntable big game than any other state other than Alaska. And we are famous for elk hunting in New Mexico. Some outfitters do all kinds of different outfitted trips for various different species, but almost everybody who is a hunting outfitter hunts elk. We have, we're very well known for our elk. In addition to elk, we also have mule deer and antelope. And then you can go to the next slide. And the, those three were kind of like the, the main three that outfitters um, book trips for. Then New Mexico is unique in that we have three species of free-ranging exotic big game, which free-ranging means that they're not native to New Mexico, but they've been here for such a long time that you can hunt for these animals on, you know, like public land, anywhere. They're not behind a high fence or anything like that. They're free ranging they're just roaming roaming the wilds and you can hunt for these animals like uh like any other big game so there's oryx which is the picture on the left and then in the middle is audad which you might have heard it called barbary sheep we in new mexico commonly call them barbary sheep and then on the right hand side are ibex persian ibex and they are um they are restricted to one little mountain range in southern New Mexico called the Floridas. And um, they're very unique and very sought after in the hunting world. Next slide. Then New Mexico also has two species of bighorn sheep. We have Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep and we also have desert bighorn sheep. And over the past 20 years, the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish has been extremely successful in their reintroductory of bighorn sheep. And it has really put New Mexico on the map with sheep hunters around the world. And um, every year outfitters in New Mexico that outfit sheep, um, they attend, uh, trade shows where these bighorn sheep raffles and um, enhancement tags are sold. And it's not uncommon for a bighorn sheep, uh, an outfitted bighorn sheep hunt to sell for like $200,000. That's, that's kind of on par with um, how the enhancement tags are sold every year. And every dollar of that goes back to the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish and it pays for the reintroductory program. And all of those um, dollars are generated from people out of state. And I should back up a little bit and say that 95% of an outfitter clientele in New Mexico, whether it be hunting or fishing or recreation is all non-resident. So um, people from out of state that are coming to New Mexico to book book with an outfitter because they are unfamiliar with New Mexico and the outfitter knows the territory. Okay, next slide. We also have predator hunting. Black bear are the types of bear that we have in New Mexico. And we also have cougar hunting. And um, in New Mexico, we still hunt with dogs. So it's, um, so there are, there's a whole in industry in itself for individuals who have dogs that um, help hunt predators. And that would be another segment of employment under the outfitter would be um, someone who has dogs. Okay. Um, yes, let's, yes, bird game. So we also have birds. We don't have near as many birds as some other states but um, we do have bird game. 
And then our largest bird game is turkey, of course, and we have um, three different species of turkey and are well known for our turkey opportunities. And then we are less known for our other bird game, quail, ducks, and then we also have like sandhill crane, dove hunting, and some other bird species that are a little bit less common, but we still do have those opportunities. So next, next one. So before I move to fishing, I wanna mention also that hunting and fishing and recreation in New Mexico takes place on both public lands and on private lands. And New Mexico is basically 50-50 in terms of our public land and private land um, makeup of the state. So in the outfitting industry, it's extremely important that we work with private landowners in order to um, maintain that opportunity also on private land because there is a large percentage of our wild game and fish are located on private land. So in the fishing segment, New Mexico um, is also well known for our fishing. Of course, here in New Mexico, we know we don't have a ton of water, but the water that we do have is very famous for trout. We have many different species of trout, both native and non-native, for people to fish for. Um, and you can move to the next slide. And so a, a lot of that in the outfitting industry is done through fly fishing. And it doesn't have to be fly fishing. There's plenty of people who, you know, fish rivers with, with a regular reel and um, have you know just as much success but most outfitted fishing trips are fly fishing and they're done on all kinds of little creeks that you would think don't necessarily have any fish but they they do and they get way way back in there in the back country very far miles and miles from any road or community so next slide and then um, you'll see the, the, the two pictures on the right are both pictures of the San Juan River. And the New Mexico San Juan River is famous and basically world renowned for its trout waters. And um, this is one of our few rivers in New Mexico where you can actually fish from a boat essentially. And um, there's many outfitters that operate fishing trips along the San Juan. And then that picture on the left is actually a picture of a northern pike in um, Eagle Nest Lake. And so I didn't want it to get left out that we do also have lake fishing, bass, tiger muskie, pike. Um, and so we do have plenty of outfitters who will um, take a client onto a lake and lake fish if that's what they want to do. Next slide. The last segment of outfitted opportunity in New Mexico is recreation. And um, so that kind of like I said before can include many different things. Trail rides, summer trail rides on horseback is probably the most common um, in uh, with outfitters who also do hunting excursions in the winter. A lot of them will do trail rides in the summer. Uh, and then also, which is, is a little, it's kind of a segment of trail rides is drop camps. And so what drop camps are, and they do summertime drop camps and they also do hunting drop camps. And essentially what a drop camp is, is an outfitter will go into the back country on horseback, miles and miles, you know, 10 or 20 miles from the nearest road. And they'll set up a camping area and um, an individual will, with their family, um, book a drop camp opportunity with the outfitter, and then the outfitter will come and, and get them from a, a trail location. They will pack them into the backcountry via horseback, and then they just drop them off there for however long the people want to go camping. And so it's, it's a wilderness experience that many outfitters provide for individuals who, who don't have livestock. Next slide. Other types of um, just general outdoor recreation 
would be hiking. And then also I put that picture on the left. It, that's a picture of uh, Vermejo Lodge. And so many people will come from out of state and, and basically all they're looking for is a very nice lodge, a resort type experience in the middle of the woods. And so there, there is more of those opportunities than people realize in New Mexico. So if an individual just wants to come and relax for a week, then they can do that. Next slide. So how do you become an outfitter? Well, you don't need any special education. You don't have to go to college if you don't want to. I mean, of course you can if you want, if you ultimately want to become an outfitter, a business owner, it's probably good to have some type of a business degree so that you know how to, how to run the business side. But in terms of the actual outfitting, the actual guiding that goes on in the woods, all you need to know is, is, that you like being in the wilderness and that you like being uh, in the woods or on the river um, or on horseback. And, and that's all you need is a desire to just spend as much time as you can in the woods. And um, then there's some technical aspects that you want to follow. Um, if you're interested in becoming an outfitter or guide, you want to apprentice first. And so apprentice, what that means is you want to just, um, you can, you know, wherever you are, wherever you end up, whether it's in New Mexico or some other state, you want to contact the Outfitter and Guide Association and get yourself in contact with a, an actual professional who's already operating in that area. And you want to um, just ask if you can watch them, ask if you can observe what they do and see if that's something that you are interested in. If you decide that it, it is something that you want to do and you are here in New Mexico, you have to become a licensed guide first. And so what that encompasses is just a, an exam that you have to take at the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. And um, it's a pretty easy exam. It just basically makes sure that you know all of, all of the game rules that are associated with hunting. And, um, and then you get a license and you have to operate as a guide under a licensed outfitter for three years before you can start your own outfitting business. And that's the way that it works in hunting. It's kind of the way it works in fishing, although it's not quite as strict because you don't have to be licensed by Game and Fish. But you should still follow those same general steps, apprentice, and then um, you know work on, on becoming a guide. And then if you eventually want to start your own business, you can do that too. Um, I would be glad to answer any questions. That's kind of the end of my presentation and I would be glad to, to answer any questions if you have some. All right, so I stopped the screen share so that I could see um, everyone on our screen again. And thank you, Carrie. I appreciate it. That's super interesting information. It's uh, really cool how our lineup of 10 cool conservationists all have jobs that are so incredibly different from one another. Um, so we're definitely learning every day a completely different uh, branch of how we can contribute to our wildlife and landscapes here in New Mexico. Um, does anyone have questions for Carrie? You can, Hunter, you can go ahead and um, unmute yourself, babe. Um, do you like fishing yourself? And if you do, uh, what's your favorite type of fishing, like fly fishing or bass fishing? That's a fantastic question. Hunter, is that right? Is that your name? Yeah. Thank you, Hunter, for that question. I used to not enjoy fishing. My dad would take us fishing and I found it very boring. And then I discovered fly fishing and just you know, having the motion of the rod in your hand and being out on the river, I found just so relaxing. And so I really, really found that fly fishing was what I really was interested in. But that's what's great about the hunting and fishing industry is that if, uh, if one area you don't find works for you, there's so many other areas that you can find to love. Great question, Hunter. Hunter, I just realized I know you, don't I? 
Yeah, we've met before. It took me three classes to realize that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Eli, you have a question, babe? Go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Do you hunt? Great question, Eli. Um, I just started. I'm kind of a novice. So I got to tell you, I came into this job. Um, my husband was a hunter, but I didn't hunt myself. And I just um, thought it was kind of a learning experience. And then I discovered that I just love the hunting and fishing industry. And I wanted to make this my career. So I just started hunting. I've hunted elk a couple of times. I got myself a cow elk a couple years ago and um, I really, really like it. So I, I put in for the draw just like everybody else every year and I cross my fingers. And this year I drew an either sex elk tag in um, unit 43. So I'm super excited. It's an October rifle hunt, super excited. Wonderful, great question, Eli. Sorry, my dog. <laughs> Um, okay, any other questions? Diego you can raise or you can put it in the group chat. Go ahead, Yancy, sorry. No, oh, sorry, Diego had a question. Oh, sorry, Diego. Oh, I already got my answer. Oh. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, anybody else? You can use the group chat. I know there's a lot of you guys that are off screen. Um, please don't make that um, prevent you from asking questions. You're more than welcome to put them in the group chat and I can ask them for you if you don't want to come on screen and ask them. Before we move on, nobody else? I noticed that in the group oh. chat, it, um, someone posted that is a very scary sheep. Just <laughs> wondering what, what, they think is scary about sheep. I love sheep. Let's see who I saw that too. David, David, do you want to unmute yourself and explain why you think that that looks scary? Oh, hold on, David. There you go. Go ahead. Um, well, to me, it just kind of looks like. Oh yeah. It's just staring you down. Yeah. yeah like it was staring me down. And when a large sheep is staring you down with horns, I find that a little bit scary. <laughs> I think that's fair enough. I think that's fair enough, David. That's a pretty good explanation. <laughs> in this industry was the Wild Sheep Foundation show and I fell in love with sheep. And they, they say you're either like a sheep person or you're not a sheep person. And I'm totally a sheep person. I have an Altai Argali is like my bucket list hunt. So maybe I'll get there someday. Nice. Diego, did you have another question? Who's responsible for the hunting lottery? I've never hunted myself, so I'm not really sure um how that works that is a great question is and how many uh, hunters can participate yeah that that's a great question the hunting industry is so complicated and so i um you know i really tried to be on a very thirty thousand foot level with my presentation this morning but um yeah so basically the public draw in new mexico is run by the new mexico department of game and fish and so you apply um, and you can go to the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish website to learn more about that. But essentially every year you can apply between January and the deadline is in March. And then um, it's a lottery just like, or, or like any other raffle, um, you put in for what you want and then it's the luck of the drop. So in New Mexico, it's just everybody starts on the same playing field every year. Some states work differently, but New Mexico, it's just everyone's on the same playing field every year. And in April, they'll release the draw uh, results, and then you'll know whether or not you have a license. 
in in the private i should also mention in the private sector it doesn't work like that it's not a lottery it's um equal opportunity you can purchase a landowner tag at any time um any year it doesn't you're not restricted to a lottery draw Oh, okay. Oh, I think he has one more card. And who decides how many? What's the cap to how many hunters? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so the Department of Game and Fish biologists essentially decide what the game populations look like in terms of what the harvest ability is and where the uh, population management needs to be so the department of game and fish is who sets those numbers and every year they do surveys to determine what the population looks like to make sure that we are um, that we're not harvesting more than um, than we can sustain in nature okay thank you no problem all right it looks like we have one more question from jackson jackson go ahead and unmute yourself bud Do you need to do a, a draw for um, only big game or most all game? Do you need to do it for just big game? That is a really, really good question. So um, yes, big game primarily goes through the draw. Now you also want to remember that the private land, they have opportunities. Those opportunities are generally a little bit more expensive but you don't have to go through a lottery draw for those big game opportunities. Um, so, but almost all of the big game opportunities on the public land side are through the draw. You can get some over the counter deer tags. You can get some over the counter Barbary sheep tags um, and you can get some over the counter antelope tags, but you got to kind of know what, what you're doing. Um, and then in terms of like bird game or small game, there's lots of youth opportunity, especially in, in those smaller segments. So if you just want to start hunting and you've never tried it before, then you should definitely start with small game, bird game. Um, there's also like squirrel season, you know, um, lots of little varmints and, uh, or coyotes. Coyotes are unprotected. You can hunt coyotes. So um, yeah, still lots of opportunities, even if you don't draw a big game hunt. Cause I'm I'm looking at game, uh, small game hunting, and I just got into it. I just got my certification, so I can hunt. That's awesome. Good luck. Good start. Very good. Fantastic, Jackson. All right. Any other questions before we move on? Me. Oh, I don't know who said me. David. Oh, okay, David. Go ahead, bud. Um. Uh. What about bow and arrow? Um, I actually have a bow and arrow. I have a bow and arrow. So how does the hunting part play into the bow and arrow? Yeah, that's great. You want to make sure that your bow and arrow is, is big enough for hunting. Um, I, I think David's going to go get it. Um, <laughs> but then also you have to realize that there's different seasons for different weapon types. And so you want to make sure that you're using the right weapon type in the right season. And then you also, that also kind of runs through the draw. So that kind of goes back to, I think it was Diego's question about the hunting industry and how complicated it is. You really want to make sure you understand the rules before you start out and um, the Department of Game and Fish has uh, a booklet which they call the RIB, but is more commonly known as the Proclamation. And um, that's where you can find a lot of information on weapon types. So here's my bow. I like it. That, that looks legit. Thanks. Right. Well, those are some great questions for Carrie. And Carrie, I just want to say thank you very much for joining us this morning. We appreciate all your time and uh, we appreciate you being one of the 10 coolest conservationists here in New Mexico. Um, and we're going to hand it over now to Angela. 
um, a completely different side of conservation and we're excited to learn about her story and how she became involved um, in her, what I will let her explain her career in conservation. Good morning. Um, love Carrie's talk. I like seeing all the animals. Um, <clears throat> so I kind of work on the flip side. Uh, she mentioned biologists set the, uh, the hunting limits and all that sort of stuff. And that's with New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. I work with the US Fish and Wildlife Service in the fisheries. And my office takes care of the threatened and endangered species. So these are the species um, that you can't always hunt or fish for um, because their numbers are too low and their populations wouldn't be able to sustain it. That's not always the case for all T&E. Um, we do have one fish here in New Mexico that you can fish for even though it is a listed species and that is the Gila trout down in the Gila wilderness. And um, some of the things that she was talking about where you're packing in and to get to those backcountry wilderness areas, we actually do that on the job to get to uh, the Gila trout range where we can get in and monitor their populations and stuff. So there's, there's always some overlap, um, but there's those differences too that uh, separate us just a little bit. But overall, it's that love for our fisheries and wildlife that kind of drive all of us. So I am going to share my screen. So I um, got my start in fisheries for back in high school. Um, I attended an inner city school and uh, they were trying to get inner city kids, so city kids involved in natural resources. Um, so the Missouri Department of Conservation, I grew up out in Kansas City, uh, came to our school and actually rounded a few of us up. And out of all of them, I actually stuck with it and got hired on for my first summer. Uh, the job itself was supposed to be um, fish, uh, wildlife, and law enforcement. Um, but as, as it went, I've worked there for three summers. Fisheries was always the one with the job. Um, so that's where, I, that's where my, my heart ultimately ended up. Um, so I was actually freeze tagging um, some fish here. It was a test to see if they could um, tell these marks in the wild and be able to tell a hatchery from wild source. So this was back when I was like 17 years old and getting into introduced into this. And I didn't know the types of jobs like these were available. So going into this, I liked the outside. I liked working with animals even more. So I thought I was just gonna be a veterinarian. I thought that was my only option um, up until I started working with these guys. Um, the wilderness side of things. So I learned that Canada geese molt their flight feathers. So there's a period of time that they can't fly and biologists take the advantage and use this opportunity to actually do Canada goose roundup. So this was the start of my summer every year, um, getting up before the crack of dawn, um, getting boats loaded up with the gear we needed. And we would actually corral these guys like cattle and um, you can't see people on the shoreline there on the, on the bottom, but we'd have pens and the boats would actually push these guys onto the shore and staff that are hidden off on the shoreline would actually start pushing them in and then corralling them into the pens. And then we would do our biologist thing. We would look for population numbers, males, females, um, juveniles, how well they're reproducing. And a lot of times we use this as an opportunity to relocate uh, to get the younger uh, geese to imprint on a, a different lake if their their numbers were getting too high. So I know on one occasion we actually transferred um, geese from Missouri out to Kansas um, because some of our lakes were getting a little overwhelmed. And we'd also take this opportunity, um, unfortunately, with uh, the litter, you know, we'd have those that uh, they'd get fishing line wrapped up on their wings, they'd get or their legs, or they'd get a hook in them, something like that. So we would try to address that at the same time. 
and that was just high school. So that was a, a great experience. I was spoiled on all other jobs that teenagers usually would get um, just because um, I got to work out in the field doing this uh, for my first job. And then uh, I did go to college. So I graduated from the University of Arizona down in Tucson. And many biologists will tell you experience is key. Um, getting out there in the field and really figuring out that this is what you want to do. Um, like I said, I like all animals. Fisheries is where I went professionally, but give me the opportunity and I'll work with any animal you give me. Um, so I had the opportunity to volunteer slash work for the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum as a raptor handler. Uh, so I worked with these big boys. This is a uh, Harris's hawk. Uh, this was kind of my gateway bird uh, as far as when it comes to raptors. Um, because these guys will hunt in a pack. So you have your alpha and your uh, betas um, and, you, and they would actually take out larger prey just because they had the power of numbers. So this was a really cool bird for me to work with. I also worked with kestrels and barn owls and we had roadrunners there as part of the program. But if you ever get the opportunity uh, and you're down in the Tucson area, I highly recommend the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum. Uh, it's all the animals of the Southwest, and it's um, not your traditional zoo because uh, it's also representing the habitats that they're coming from. So you actually have to look for the javelina or you have to look for uh, some of those other animals because they're out hiding in their desert habitat enclosures. Um, I would also get the opportunity to do things like tra um, tracking Havelina. So in college, uh, helping with the study, they were tracking, they had Havelina radio collared, and we'd have to go out there and figure out where they went and how they were moving and if they were surviving. Um, so a lot of times, uh, volunteer where you can just to get the feel for it. It's definitely, I would recommend it. Um, even did a stint as an animal control officer at one point. So you go where, where uh, the opportunities are at. So eventually I did make it into the Fish and Wildlife Service and that was in 2008. Um, so my job has evolved since my time starting. Uh, I work uh, a lot of the field work um, supporting the projects throughout our five major watersheds here in New Mexico. So we have the Pecos, the San Juan, the Canadian, the Rio Grande, and the Gila. And unfortunately, we have a listed species on every major river drainage now. Uh, so we travel throughout the state uh, to where the fish are at and to go looking for them and um, finding, uh, doing monitoring their populations. We're uh, looking at habitat and figuring out uh, ways that we can protect them and ultimately prevent them from extinction. Um, so behind me, we have a lot of uh, aquariums, 75 gallon aquariums. And then in front of that, there's actually two 1200 gallon systems. So as part of a fish biologist, even though that is one job, we have lots of things you can do even as a fish biologist. Um, so one of that is being in a hatchery where you're either working with raising fish for recreation um, to provide those fishing opportunities or you're raising and studying fish for recovery. Um, so we have both kind of those facilities here in New Mexico. State has several um, hatcheries here where they raise fish for recreational stockings. And then we have a couple of federal facilities that are raising fish for recovery. So like Mora National Fish Hatchery is raising Gila trout both for recovery and recreation. And then we have facilities down like uh, the Southwest Native Aquatic Resource Recovery Center. I think I got that acronym right. And they have multiple species of fish that are in trouble that they need that little extra support. So there's lots of things you can do just even within the fisheries. And then even when you get into that field, you might get changed up a little bit. Um, Sometimes projects or emergency responses are so large that they'll actually group together um, a large uh, variety of biologists and experts to come out and assist. So this is something I got to do, um, even though I was a fish biologist, 
got detailed out at the Louisiana coast in 2010 when we had that large uh, BP oil spill. So I was on a recovery and reconnaissance team and we're looking for wildlife that's injured and damaged um, due to the oil spill. And I actually had a crash course in birds. Um, so uh, the work we do, it's definitely team oriented. Uh, there's a lot of uh, working hand in hand not only between individuals in your office, but also those around around you and the different agencies and nonprofits um, that we go out and work with. So just some of the work, they were cleaning up one of the beaches along the coast there um, and removing the tar balls, which is basically the oil mixing in with the sand, which kind of got really nasty. Um, some of the birds we got to look for Piping plover was actually a T&E species and we were looking to make sure those guys hadn't been um, hurt too bad. Um, but the diversity of birds down there was amazing because uh, of the nesting colonies that they had down there. So back into fisheries though, um, lots of different things that our office does. One of them is actually fish rescue because our Rio Grande goes dry almost every year. The last year it didn't go dry and made it the entire year uh, was in 2008. And of course, you know, you gotta be willing to get down and dirty. Um, of course, we're following a river as it's drying. Ah, it makes for us some sticky situations here. So I'm posing with our, our UTV here that we ultimately had to dig out. So we're down on our hands and knees and using uh, a few tools of the trade along with it with our winches and stuff but um, we're going out there looking for federally listed endangered species in this case we were looking for the rio grande silvery minnow that was getting uh, stuck in isolated pools and trying to recover them and getting them to moving water uh, just to help their population um, but definitely it's a it can be a dirty job here and there other times we go in to rescue, uh, we do emergency fire evacuations. So that Gila trout that I mentioned earlier, um, in 2012, we had the Whitewater Baldy Complex fire. Uh, so we had crews going in. Um, I was on the hatchery side of things. So I was actually dr driving the hatchery truck in and receiving fish that they were pulling out. The gentlemen there are standing by a custom made fish hauling tank and then we had another crew who actually packed in on horses and mules uh, to go and collect the fish from streams that had just been hit by fire. And we were actually racing storms trying to get in there before the ash flows hit and damaged the water quality and killed off the fish. So just the closer up, that's the pilot behind there. So another job you can do related to conservation. This he was actually pretty skilled because he's operating this chopper um, we had to have math in this, definitely math involved. You gotta know your math, can't get away from it. Um, we had to have this tank measured, weighed. Uh, we had to account for the amount of water that we're hauling and the amount of fish, um, just to make sure we didn't exceed the, the chopper's uh, capacity.
of one other uh, potential career you could do in conservation. If you weren't actually on the biology side, you could be a helicopter pilot. Um, this is actually a pretty skilled uh, gentleman here. He's got not only to maneuver the, the chopper, but he's actually got to maneuver that 100 foot lead line with uh, a couple hundred pounds of fish uh, swinging down below. And he, in this case, he was actually stocking fish back in, and this was after a couple years after the fires. So we're trying to get Gila trout back into those remote headwater streams. So lots of different ways that you could be involved uh, without necessarily being a, a biologist. Uh, different ways that we go about collecting fish, right? Because it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, so I make a horrible angler. I'm not very good at it. I don't have the patience um, just because I've experienced fishing in this manner. So we're using electricity to collect the fish here um, as we're going through and sampling um, to get those that data that we need to make those management calls. Um, so having this shortcut here, I don't make a very patient angler when I have to sit there on rod and reel and try to, to catch a fish, just you know, hoping they, they bite my lure. Um, so one of the ways we get out there and we're using electricity again, that's using math because we gotta get those volts and amps just right so that we're not harming the fish because of course these are teeny fish that we're looking for, especially here in the Gila. Um, there's at least three listed species, possibly a fourth, and then a, a fifth one out in the membranes. Six. There's multiple species in the Gila that are in trouble, so we don't want to harm them. So we're we use our math uh, to make sure we're putting out just enough to catch them, but not hurt them and release them when we're done. We also on some of the bigger rivers out on like uh, the San Juan River, uh, another form of electrofishing. We're actually using a generator powered electrofisher. Uh, to push it out just because there's way more water and we're dealing um, with uh, a tip, different type of habitat. So we'll go out rafting on the San Juan looking for some of these bigger fish um, that also has, uh, let's see, we have two listed species on the San Juan River that we're, that we're looking for. Then we do smaller things, man power, such as this on the Rio Grande where we're using a pain. This is another active collection method. Oh, yeah. We get pretty excited. 10.9. Yesterday, out on the Rio Grande, um, looking for the Rio Grande silvery minnow. And we were also doing a study out here looking for fish that we had previously tagged uh, the week before. And ultimately, it's about the fish, right? So we have lots of ways to collect our fish, and then we um, get the information we need off of these guys. This is a Gila fish. Uh, this is a Sonora sucker, uh, full-grown adult, um, and a native. Um, so we're gathering uh, lengths and weights. We're looking to see if there's juveniles in the system, uh, making sure we have mature adults, uh, that all life stages are present, and a lot of times when we're dealing with threatened and endangered species, that's where we run into the problems is either they're not reproducing or they're reproducing, but we're not seeing um, many adults. Um, so we start uh, looking into the problems and trying to figure out what's happening to these populations. If it's habitat related, if it's a non-native species coming in and competing for resources, um, if it's a health issue, if uh, that, that's our, our problem solving portion of it, is once we get the data in hands, how do we fix it? So San Juan, this is my big fish, uh, probably the biggest I've caught out on the San Juan. I, yeah, I think it was between three to four feet long, and this is a Colorado pike minnow. Um, this is an endangered species. It was first listed in 1976 the year I was born. Um, so a lot of times these are long standing problems. They go across generations. Um, and so that's where the next part of my job comes in is getting these stories out to the public and to youth and to adults like you 
is sharing the, the, the stories of these fish that a lot of people don't get to see. Here in New Mexico, we have about 66 native fish species. And when you ask somebody what species they know, they'll usually say something like the rainbow trout or channel catfish, which is cool. They know a fish, but the rainbows are non-native and the channels are only, they're not native across New Mexico. So we have so many other species and it's part of my job to share some of that with them. So here I am on the Pecos sharing uh, the Mexican tetra, which is a relative of a piranha. And not many people know that. We have a relative of the piranha, teeth and all, um, that live right here in New Mexico. So we'll do community outreach things like this, where we're out there for the Dragonfly Festival, or we'll go into the classrooms and we'll do anatomy. Uh, we'll, you know, you get to see the insides and the inner workings of a fish. And as you learn the anatomy of any animal, even especially if you're hunting and fishing um, and learning something about their, their life history, it helps you become a better fisherman or a better uh, hunter because you know something about what you're going after. Um, and it's just like that with fisheries, with your fish. Um, to make you a good, a good angler. It helps to know a little bit about their anatomy um, and you take better care of them. So if you're doing catch and release or you get something that's too small, uh, you need to throw it back. If you know to keep your hands wet because of that slime coat, um, that slime coat's part of their immune system. So uh, you know to have your hands wet. You know that they have gills and they need water in order to pull the oxygen out um, from the water. They can't breathe if they're not in the water. So you, you work, work those things in um, to make you a, a better sportsman out in the field. And in the classroom, um, you're, you're applying your math and science. So one of my big programs is actually getting some of our native fish out into the classroom so that uh, students actually get the opportunity to see some of these fish. Um, the, for this first time this year, we actually got the Rio Grande Silver Minnow uh, which was listed in 1994, the year I graduated high school. Um, we got those guys out into the classroom and it's the first time that students actually got to see this endangered species. Um, just because these are long-standing problems and the more people that know about them, the more people that see them, hopefully uh, we'll have better support and more of an effort to protect these guys so they don't go extinct. So I think with that, that's all I have to share on the screen. Do you guys have any questions? Clear that off. Let's see, any questions? I knew a question would come from Hunter and he was the first one to raise his hand. Hunter, go ahead, unmute yourself, bud. Well, I know that the Rio Grande cutthroat trout was recently taken off the endangered list. Did you ever do any work with them? I'm sorry, I, I had to turn up my volume. Could you say that one more time? I know that the Rio Grande cutthroat trout was recently taken off the endangered list. Uh, did you ever do any work with them? We do work with them and they were not actually formally listed. They were proposed for listing uh, a few years back um, but because so much effort is already gone into them with New Mexico Department of Game and Fish, Fish and Wildlife Service, they decided not to list. Uh, we do work with them occasionally and they are a part of our Fish in the Classroom program. Um, so we have several schools that are learning about them and raising Rio Grande Cut. Uh, and we actually release those fish up towards Taos uh, in Pilar. Um, just because they require a colder uh, habitat and down here in Albuquerque is not suitable for those guys. Uh, so they'll, they'll go up north, but um, we do some work, uh, especially if it's with the tribes because our, we also work with our tribal partners, that's part of our responsibility, but because it's not officially listed, we're not the lead agency. Question Hunter, looks like Jackson has a question. Go ahead, Jackson. Um, in Corrales, there in the in one of our irrigation ditches, if you when it's shallow, you can see so many silvery minnows. That's one of the reasons why they're endangered because 
the irrigation dishes, ditches, they get irrigated into people's yards, and then they die. And I catch them all the time. It's a possibility. Um, there's also, they look a lot like your flathead chub uh, when they are little. So you can also start looking to see if you can see the differences. Because we have two fish that look a lot alike. But yes, unfortunately, the silver minnow has several, several threats facing them. Good question, Jackson, or not really a question. Thank you for sharing, Jackson. Max, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, one time when the Rio Grande flooded all the way up to uh, above the irrigation ditch, but there's like a wall in Corrales, um, it flooded over where it usually is. And after it drained out, there's this pool of silvery minnows so me and Alex went, th went there, caught them in a jar, and then moved them over to the irrigation ditch where there was actually a lot of water and it wasn't very fast moving. And there was a bunch of snakes in there too. So you did your own fish rescue. And that flooding is actually a part of the natural cycle of the Rio Grande. So flooding, when we, when we start looking at the animals and the habitat that live around here, everything is adapted to a specific set of patterns. So these fish were adapted for natural floodings, for that spring runoff. When the floodwaters would come up, um, the silvery minnow are pelagic spawners, so they broadcast their eggs and their eggs float just below the surface. And as the waters rise, and you start flooding over bank, it puts those eggs in slower moving water with a lot, of, a lot of vegetation and debris, and it gives them food because they're herbivorous. Ooh. So it gives them a food source and protects them from some of those predators. And at the same time, what's happening or what would happen is your cottonwood stands. That's when your cottonwood seeds would also start to grow. And the roots of the cottonwoods would race the flood water, so as the flood water started to recede, your cottonwoods got down into the groundwater. Um, so that's when we would have a healthy stand of cottonwoods because we had that action happening every spring that would shift those flood waters and moving around. Um, our ma last major floods were in 1940, which is why we have so many old cottonwoods um, that are nearing the end of their life cycle because we don't have the major floods that we used to. Right. Anybody else have any questions or any comments? David has his hand raised. David, did you have something to say? Um, what's your favorite type of fish? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I like the picture I have of the Colorado pike minnow because that's such a cool fish. Um, but I also like the river carp sucker. Uh, it's a, a sucker faced fish that really, it's a it can be a pretty large fish with this itty bitty mouth. Um, so it's a toss up uh, between those two guys. The Colorado pike minnow is so unique because it is actually a true minnow and it's a fish eating minnow, um, if you can believe it. So New Mexico's got a few, a couple of few, uh, a couple of unique fish here that we get to brag about. Jackson. Oh, uh Jackson go and then Diego next. I have a comment. In the Pecos, I caught something that looked like a giant uh, piranha. You talked about them and you said that they actually lived there. I thought it was someone's pet and they put it in there because it was too big because it was at least like 10 pounds. Oh, let's see. So the Mexican tetra is a small fish. It doesn't get that big. So maybe three to five inches. It was as big as a basketball and at least 10 to 15 pounds. Yeah, I no, have wow. to see it. And unfortunately, um, that's one of those things that we really try to discourage is the release of your pet fish. Um, piranhas are one of those aquarium fish that people do get their hands on and occasionally let go. Um, so who knows, you might have seen a piranha in the Pecos. It was. I searched it up and it looked like a Paku. They're supposed to live in Florida. Oh. What happens if I find them again? What should I do? 
Oh, let's see. I'd have to check the proclamation um, and see if it's any of the it listed species. Um, but it's potentially removing it. <laughs> if you can confirm it's a non-native. Um, but I'd actually have a picture of it. Yep. Oh, we don't have a picture of it, but it was, we caught, um, a person caught it and then they didn't know what to do with it and they gave it to us and I'm like, what the heck is this? And then I searched it up and it was a Paco. It looked like a Paco, but. Oh, yeah. But it was orange and black. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. All right, Diego. Which river or creek is the safest for fishing? How do you mean safest? Like less dangerous for the fish. Um, do you like the, the Gila River maybe? Or is that like private? What is oh. the most safe river maybe? Um, so it's pretty much knowing, uh, just like Carrie mentioned, knowing your lands. Um, there is public and private, um, and you just gotta know the access points. Uh, you can pretty much fish on any, oh, that's not, that one's a hard one for me because I don't fish very much. Um, New Mexico Department of Game and Fish is a good resource to have um, and those will identify the fishable waters and um, you'll also need to know that uh, go through game and fish because you'll also through the pro proclamation they'll identify which species you can actually fish for um, so you'll look for that signage with the creel and um, through the proclamation what's allowed to be fished for um, I Gila trout, I do know you'd need a secondary tag in addition to your main fishing license, but that is the extent of my fishing knowledge. Um, so when it comes to fishing and fishing waters, I'm not a good resource. Okay, that's good. Thank you. All right, it looks like Elizabeth has a question. Elizabeth? Um, I liked your presentation. But I'm an environmental science major, so I'm kind of curious in going into the field that you're in. Uh, so what did you major in? And would you recommend travel uh, to gain experience? So I have a bachelor's of science in renewable natural resources. My degree is wildlife, watershed, and rangeland resources with option in fisheries. Um, they shortened the title the year after I graduated, uh, but pretty much I'm in fisheries and then had a base across the board. I would definitely recommend volunteering or getting internships um, while you're still in school to get a feel for what you want to do um, out uh, once you graduate. And even once you graduate and you get a job and you figure out, eh, this isn't quite what I want to do, you can switch it up. Um, I would definitely recommend the internships and volunteering uh, to get a feel for the job. Um, and the earlier you can do that to help also build your resume and show your flexibility, uh, that would also be good. Uh, like I said, I was even an animal control officer at one point in time. Um, and that kind of, you learn different things. So if you get a job, um, it may not be what you want to do, but definitely take those good points. Control, I learned about, you know, talking with people and being able to talk on rules and regulations and trying to enforce that in a positive way um, and kind of finding my voice. I was very timid before I was an animal control officer. If you can't tell now, I'm super shy. <laughs> But that's what I got out of animal control. It wasn't necessarily what my degree was for, um, but it gives you a different view. And if you can travel, um, I know there are several biologists in my field that would recommend travel. Um, you get to see different parts of the world. You get to see 
even if it's just in the United States, you get to learn all these perspectives and um, kind of gives you that ability to be more open about what's happening around you. Some of the issues that we have aren't necessarily the same for the East Coast. Here in the Southwest, major water issues, right? And sharing a very finite amount versus the East Coast where there's water everywhere. It's, it's you know, their habitat issues are a different concern, you know, invasives like snakeheads and Asian carp because there's so much water, all these invasives are coming in and they're having that international um, movement. So um, I haven't traveled much. Um, once I, you know, I, I started in Missouri because that's where my family lived. I moved back to the Southwest. I haven't moved a whole lot once I got here in the Southwest, um, but I've had that opportunity to have those details like Louisiana and seeing issues that they're facing there. Um, so if you can incorporate some of that travel and you're flexible enough, go for it um, and be open to new experiences because you never know what might actually catch your fancy. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, I'm gonna call that the last question because we are 10 after 10 and I don't wanna keep Angela too long, but thank you, Angela, for coming today. And thank you, Carrie, I know she's still on the call as well, um, for sharing your awesome conservation careers with us. We appreciate you. We appreciate all the efforts that you put into protecting our wildlife and our landscapes and our waters. And don't forget, guys, we will be here tomorrow. Uh, with two more cool conservationists from nine o'clock to 10 o'clock. So we hope to see everybody then. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. We appreciate you. Thank you, Carrie. We appreciate you. Thanks. Thank you. It was a Bye. good time. <laughs>